How y'all doing? How do you respond to that, right? You're sitting out there. I'm doing good. I'm doing a lot better. Uh, James talked to us for the last three weeks about rest. <clears throat> I've been grateful not only to get some rest, uh, but have some time to, to think on all that, about what the Lord has to tell us about rest. Um, still reflecting on that. I hope you, you are as well. Um, Lord willing, next week when we, when we get into Genesis 11, we're going to get a great illustration of why we struggle so much to rest. Um, but before we go there, Genesis 11, we got to get through Genesis 10. Uh, another Toledot. It's another genealogy, right? It's genealogy day again, folks. Uh, sort of, sort of. Um, what we're looking at today in Genesis 10 is kind of unique. It's often called the table of nations, okay? Uh, not like dinner table table, right? Like accountant table table, uh, like, a, like a list kind of table. And it's really, it's a one-of-a-kind view of the whole world. Um, and as we go there, let me, let me start out by asking you to say something. Um, we, you know, we say God has a heart for the whole world, don't we? We say that. God has a heart for the whole world. I believe that. My, my wife and I, um, our family, we spent most of our you know, married life involved in tribal missions, either preparing to go overseas uh, or serving overseas or sharing with churches about it. About 20 years in total, uh, the preparation and all that. And all of it was based on the conviction that God's heart is for the whole world. But here's the thing. How do we know that's true? And, and you say, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, well, it hasn't always been in some ways, at least not even to the followers of Jesus. It was one of the challenges that they faced. Um, one of the challenges of the Bible is this. In the early chapters of Genesis, up until now, we've seen this big picture view, right? The whole world. God's dealing with the whole world. The whole world's unfocused. All the people in the world are unfocused. But things are about to take a big turn. Okay, we're going to get to Genesis 12, and we're going to move from this global focus down to one family. One family. And from there on out, it'll be Abraham and his descendants, basically. Uh, not just for the rest of Genesis, for the rest of the entire Hebrew Bible. Largely, the focus is on them. And even in the early parts of the New Testament, the, right, the major focus is one family, one people, and God's incredible faithfulness to them. So listen, if you just started in Genesis 1 and were working your way through the Old Testament, you can start, start to wonder, and I, can't, I, I really can't overstate this, does God have a plan to bless all the peoples of the world? Because right? he seems to focus a lot on just the children of Abraham. What about the rest of the world? I can tell you, God does care. God does care for the whole world. He does have a plan to bring, bring blessing to every people under heaven. Um, and so here we are in Genesis 10, and it's as though before the camera is going to zoom in on Abram and his family, God puts the focus one last time on the whole human race. Okay? Here in Genesis 10, this table of nations, it, it's presented to us as this comprehensive list of the origins of all the nations that would eventually spread out to cover the earth. And one of the things we can take away from Genesis 10 is a last reminder that though God is going to make unique promises to Abraham and the people of Israel, his eye is still on the whole world. He still has the world in mind. His heart truly is for the whole world. So this morning, that's where we're going, Genesis 10. And uh, to start, I'm, simply, I'm just going to read one verse. Uh, Genesis 10.1. Okay, so if, you're, if you've got your Bibles, you want to turn to Genesis 10.1. It's the first verse here. It says this, These are the family records of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they also had sons after the flood. Before we go any farther, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the morning that you've given us. We thank you for all of your word. <laughs> And as we come to it this morning, we're, we're asking that you would teach us by your spirit. Lord, we want to have your heart, your eye to see ourselves and this world the way you do. Your heart of compassion for those around us. 
Lord, to be faithful ambassadors, witnesses to the incredible mercy that we have seen in your son Jesus. And Lord, we do lift up our world to you today, a world that is broken in so many ways, rebellious in so many ways. And Lord, and Lord, we ask for your mercy. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. And, and we know that you are faithful and that you will keep your promises. Lord, we, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, not just for the sake of the people in Jerusalem, but we know that when peace comes to Jerusalem, peace will come to the whole world. And we thank you for the hope that we have in your Son. And in his name we pray. Amen. So as we get started, we're going to work through this, Genesis 10. Um, I'm going to put a map, we're going to put a map up here, uh, both so you have something to look at besides me, and because it can help us a little in orienting ourselves to all these names, okay? A quick caveat, uh, first of all, you can't see the names, right? And that's okay, because uh, you, we do not need to get hung up on the exact locations of the place names that we're going to talk about. Uh, this week, I looked through dozens I'm not kidding you, dozens of these kinds of maps. I read a ton of work done by scholars trying to locate the people uh, listed here. A, a few we can be really confident about. Uh, many we think we've got kind of a ballpark idea on, uh, but we really just don't know where, men, where to place many of the names on the list uh, with any kind of certainty. And part of that's because the details about these nations, some of them anyway, are lost to history, at least for now. Um, and partly because, especially when it comes to, you know, cities and place names, uh, they get reused a lot, okay? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Where, like, uh, so, like, where, where is Springfield? <laughs> yeah, it's like, which one? Okay, Missouri, Oregon, Illinois. There's 67 Springfields in the U.S. There's more in Britain, right? So when you reuse the name, it's like, well, which Ur, which Tarshish, which, you know, okay? Um, at any rate, the important thing I'd like to point out are the colors, and I think you can probably see the colors, okay? So, so the red are the peoples of Japheth's line in general. That's kind of the region that they uh, seem to be associated with. Green are the nations and clans coming out of Ham's line, and yellow uh, would be more Shem's line, okay? Now let's look at the text, and we're going to talk just a few specifics as we kind of get going. When we read in Genesis 10-2, about Japheth's sons, you got Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, Tiras. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to read all the names here. Um, but this list goes on with their sons. And then in verse 5, it says, From these descendants, the peoples of the coasts and the islands spread out into their lands according to their clans in their nations, each with its own language. And now, again, on this map, we aren't sure where to locate many of these people, but in general, the descendants of Japheth are all to the north of the Promised Land. Um, all that red, that seems to be the territory of the nations of the sons of Japheth. Uh, there's a few names as you read through that might stand out. Um, Ashkenaz, Ashkenaz, for example. If you've ever heard the term Ashkenazi Jew, uh, meaning a, a Jewish person living in the lands of Ashkenaz, uh, in the far north, away from the land of Israel. It refers today to Jews who lived in Europe, right? Dwelling in the tents of Japheth, uh, so to speak, far away from their homeland in the north. Again, up there, all that red. Uh, there's Javan. Uh, it's thought to be the father, father of the ancient Greeks, those who lived to the north and across the waters of the Mediterranean. Again, all up there in the red part. Uh, finally, Tarshish is in the list. Uh, might be familiar, basically the edge of the known world uh, is the place that Jonah fled to to get away from the call of the Lord to go to Nineveh, pro pro probably, possibly modern-day Spain. In general, again, okay, so the descendants of Japheth are, are people living on the edge of the world of the Israelites and, and um, thought that the people, we think that the people of Europe largely descended from Japheth. If you hail from a, a European background, in some way, probably a descendant of, of Japheth. Um, then in verse 6, we read about Ham. It says, Ham's sons were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, if you look at that map, uh, you see um, the descendants of Ham. They're a lot closer to home for the Israelites, in and around the promised land. There's, there's that green there, okay? Uh, 
Green would more or less cover the regions that the nations from Ham's descendants settled in. And from Ham, if, you, if we're going to talk specifics, uh, Ham more or less gives us a who's who of the enemies of the Israelites. Um, and this list to our ears is not going to sound all that impressive, but to an Israelite at the time of Moses, uh, this would stand out. You know, almost like, you know, if you could, if you could read a gene- genealogy that said, th- that read more or less like this, you know, um, from Ham's son, uh, sons was born Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Saddam Hussein, right? Kind of sounds like that. Uh, it's a little bit different, but you get the idea, right? So for example, Mizraim is Egypt. Some of your translations uh, may have listed it there as Egypt. Uh, when Genesis was written down, it would have been after the Israelites were rescued from the brutal slavery under the Egyptians. And throughout their, their history, Egypt is often this source of tension, uh, if not hostility, enemies, right? Okay. Canaan is here. Canaan, the father of the Canaanites, right? And you, and you notice the link to Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 19, bad places, bad people, enemies, okay? Kasla, it's not as familiar, but he's listed as the father of the Philistines, right? And Philistines, if you went to Sunday school, you know the Philistines, oh, David and Goliath, Philistines, right? The Philistine army that came against Israel. Remember that? Enemies. And then in verse 8, we get some extra information about this guy, Nimrod. Now, if you grew up watching Bugs Bunny, uh, you may have heard that name. He used to call Elmer Fudd Nimrod, right? Ooh, mighty hunter. But here, Nimrod is no Elmer Fudd. Um, Many believe that Nimrod's name means rebel. He's the father of Babylon in the land of Shinar. So the, the city and the tower at Babel, uh, that we're gonna, that's Babylon. We're going to talk about that next week. He started that, leading all the people of the earth to come together in rebellion. And then he goes to Assyria and he founded Nineveh, which would later be the capital of Assyria, where, where Jonah was called to, right? No fond memories for the Israelites of Nineveh or Assyria, it's fair to say Nimrod comes off as a, another Lamech, right? Okay, so we remember him in Genesis 4, this proud, violent conqueror. Not a good guy. Not a good guy. One commentator wrote that you could almost hear the boos of the people of Israel as the names in the line of Ham were read. And then lastly, in verse 21 and, and onward, we read about Shem. Shem would be more or less the yellow there. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of strange that Shem comes last because he's older than Japheth, uh, yet Japheth comes first in the list. And that's actually typical in Genesis that the line of promise, right, the line of the chosen people of God and of the Messiah is safe for last in these genealogies. And from Shem, we're going to be led straight to Abram, right? And like I said at, at the beginning, the focus from there on out is almost 100%. All on the family of Abraham. And then finally, we get verse 32, summarizes the chapter for us, and that's it, right? And so we, we stop and say, okay, good, good sermon. Let's all go, you know, let's, you know. So, so what? Should I, you know, <laughs> should I just skip this the next time I'm reading through Genesis? Can we just jump into chapter 11? What is this even here for, right? What does this do? Well, again, before we zoom into the story of God's special, the chosen people, We're given one last view of the whole of the human race, and it stands as a reminder to all, to all of God's people going forward of three important things, three important things, and it shows us God's heart for the world. Three important things. Our common origin, you've got these in your notes, we'll put them up on the screen, our common origin, our common problem, and our common hope. Common origin, common problem common hope. First thing here at the table of nations, Genesis 10, our common origin. There's a place in the book of Acts, Acts 17, 26. You don't have to turn there. I'll I'll, I'll read it to you. Acts 17, 26, where Paul says, from one man, he, and that's God, he's talking about God. He says, from one man, God has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live, right? From one man, and here in Genesis 10, it's clear, trace out all the lines you want, but they all come back to one man. We have a common origin. 
Here it's Noah. Uh, you could just as easily take it back to Adam. Either way, we all come from, th- from the same person. There's a sameness about the human race because we're all cut out of the same cloth. In, in Romans, and we won't look into this in detail now, Lord willing, in the future, we can give this a closer look, but in Romans, it's made clear that our guilt before God is based on our common origin in Adam, right? Go back far enough, we all come from the same person, same blood, common origin. We see that here in Genesis 10. And, you know, here's the thing. When we, when we read about Ham, for instance, right, there's the booze, oh, boo, you know, Canaan, Mizraim, all that, the enemies. But then go back just a few generations and we see these are brothers and sisters. This is family, common origin. Now, that, that common origin here, it splits into lots of nations, right? Here in Genesis 10, it goes in, it's 70. If you add them up, it's 70. Is, is the number of people between uh, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. 70 different groups of people. 70 different nations are talked about, all descended from them. 70, by the way, isn't a random number. I'm not going to go into it this morning. If you want to chase that out, Deuteronomy 32.8 is a good starting point. You can look that up later. Seven, from one man, many nations, right? Again, what, what Paul said there in Acts, from one man, he, God, made every nationality, From one man, God made every nationality to live over the whole earth. You know why there are so many nations, even though we came from one person? God did that. God made all the nations. The fact that the world is split into a diverse set of peoples is not a bad thing. God made it that way. God has a plan to unify the human race, not to make it uniform. Now, in the world today, and this isn't new, but the world today certainly frets over the diversity of nations on earth as though it is a problem, right? Some people look at the idea of there being many nations and figure that's where, our, that's where all our problems come from, right? The thinking of the day, and it's not, again, it's not new at all, is that if you wipe out the differences that exist, that'll solve all the world's problems. Jam everyone into a mold, push down hard enough, get them all doing the same thing the same way, that'll, that'll solve our issues, right? Uh, we'll read about that in the very next chapter, Genesis 11, next week. See, the tension, the tension between all these nations isn't in that there are so many. It's because we've inherited a selfish sin nature. We have a common origin. That's our problem. A rebellious sin nature, a violent sin nature. And that isn't unique to one people on earth, right? No one people has the corner on the market when it comes to doing evil. It's our common problem. Uh, One of the things I noticed about living in another country was that it's always tempting to think the problems here are because they don't do it the American way, right? Or to flip it around and and do the reverse and come to the U.S. and, and, and think, why can't we be more like, you know, more relationship oriented like the Filipinos or, you know, whatever it is. Can I tell you something? That's silly. It's really silly, okay? Um, you, you know why they have problems in the Philippines? It's not because they don't do it our way, right? It's not because, you know, the DMV isn't as efficient uh, over there as it is the one here, you know, right? What you're thinking, the DMV over there is less efficient than the one here? Like, what is that even like, you know? It's an, it's an adventure, it's, yeah, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> like, if, well, if they just did it this way and they just did it, listen, that's not the problem. You know why other countries have problems? Sin. <laughs> rebellion toward God, that's why. You know why the U.S. has issues? Sin, rebellion towards God. Many nations, different cultures, different ways of doing life. That's not the issue. It's that we have a common origin. Our problem isn't that we're different. The problem is that we all, we're all the same in the very, pers- the very worst possible way. We share a rebellious nature towards God. And that leads us right to our next point. Because we have a common origin, we have a common problem, right? I mentioned before that reading through the table of nations, again, particularly for an Israelite audience, would have understandably stirred some booze from the people. And, and after all, many of the, nation, the names in here are sworn enemies of the children of Israel, Egypt, Canaan, the Philistines, so on. But it would be a mistake, it would be a mistake 
to come to the table of nations and say, ah, yes, here's the list of the good guys, and here are the bad guys. All the people that come from that guy are the bad people. The people on that line are the good people. That's far too simplistic a way to read this. Especially in light of the rest of, of the history of Israel and of the world. Honestly, reading it that way leads to some of the worst theology. Really bad theology. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, take Ham's line. This question comes up whenever you talk about nations or tribes or ethnicity in the Old Testament. Okay, let me put it like this. A whole bunch of people on this list lived in the land that God would later promise to Abraham and his descendants forever. God made a promise that this is your land now. Okay? And this list of nations, of peoples, of tribes, it would seem, well, if you're part of one of the good groups or God's favorite tribe, well, hey, good for you. And if you aren't, well, too bad. And it leads people to wonder, is God kind of a racist? <laughs> does, he, does he just, does, is that how this works? Is that, is that what's going on? Does he just, he just has his favorites and the others, he calls for them to be wiped out purely on the basis of who they descended from. They come from the bad people, so God's going to have Israel wipe them out purely based on their race. Is that it? No. The short and emphatic answer is no. Again, one of the accusations that's often leveled at the Bible is to say it condones ethnic prejudice. And no doubt there are people who've opened the Bible and abused God's word by trying to use it to justify racism and bigotry and that sort of thing. If you read the Bible and come to the conclusion, listen, you read the Bible, you come to the conclusion that God is picking favorites based on, based on ethnicity or bloodlines, you've read it wrong. And certainly not, not read it to the end. Any situation where God pronounces judgment on a group of people is for one reason and one reason alone. It's because of sin, idolatry, evil. Okay? Some of the names in this list here do show up later in the story, and God does call for them to be expelled from the land, destroyed. But it's not because of their name or their heritage or their ethnicity. It's based on their idolatry, their evil as a group. And God deals with that. Because if you read the whole Bible, you will also find names in this list that are at times in the history of, of the people of Israel. God has said, he promised, um, he told his own people, he's going to raise up some of those people to drive his own people Israel out of the land and, and into exile. Right? It's not about race. He called for it when Israel chose idolatry and evil. It's also interesting <laughs> because once in a while you find individuals who come from some of the bad names on this list who are more honorable than many of the other of the heroes that we see in the Bible. Let me give you just one quick example. Look there in verse 15. Canaan's second son is named Heth. Ever heard of Heth before? Heth. Heth is the father of the Hethites, or as they would later be known, the Hittites. Okay? Enemies of the nation of Israel. Bad guys. Okay? The Hittites were a Canaanite clan, one of the tribes that God told the Israelites to expel from the land for their evil. But you know there was this one Hittite. His name was Uriah. Uriah the Hittite. Uh, the reason we know about him is because Uriah was one of David's mighty men, and Uriah had a beautiful wife. And Uriah, for his part, was loyal and honorable and faithful, a servant of David, the king of the Jews. Never mind his heritage. And then David stole Uriah's wife and had Uriah killed to cover it up. The summary of David's life, the man after God's own heart. This is 1 Kings 15.5. David did what was right in the Lord's eyes, and he did not turn aside from anything he had commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now that day, a Hittite of the line of Canaan acted more honorably than David did. God isn't prejudiced. We see that? He's not prejudiced. Wrong is wrong. God holds people accountable for their sin no matter where they come from. And at the same time, there can be redemption for anyone on this list who will put their trust in him. In fact, God offers redemption for people from every nation. We'll see that as we go on. So no, God is not prejudiced. Genesis 10 reminds us, because we have a common origin, we have a common problem. Pick any nation on that list, any nation. They all have the same issue, rebellion. Rebellion. Because ultimately, they all come from the same people. 
Noah and Noah from Adam and Eve. Pick any nation on this list, and somewhere in the history of the world, they have been a perpetrator of evil. The problem with the world is not the diversity of people. It's the refusal to acknowledge our guilt before God and our desperate need of him. Now, because we have a common origin and we have a common problem, that leads us to our last point, our common hope. Our common hope. And this is the good part. This is the happy part. This is the exciting part of the table of nations. See, the table of nations is unique, not just in the Bible. It's unique in ancient literature. Most origin stories care to explain one thing. Where did we come from, right? Who cares about the rest of the world? Who cares about the, the people on the fringe? We're the people of God. Our story is the story. Who, who, who cares about the rest of the world? God does. God does. I asked at the beginning, how do you know God has a heart for the whole world? How do you know he cares not just about the children of Abraham, whom he has made promises to, whom he will be faithful to? How do we know that he cares about all the nations under heaven? Well, Genesis shows us that. These chapters teach us that. We have a common origin, a common problem, which means we need a common hope, and God is going to give us just that. And the way he does that is by picking one man, one family, and not only is the rest of the book of Genesis going to focus on that family, the rest of the Old Testament is basically focused on one family, the chosen people of God, the line of Shem, the Semitic line, the Hebrews, Abraham, and God is going to bless them and stand with them and display his patience and justice and love and mercy in and through all his dealings with them. He's going to speak to them and speak through them and make unchanging promises to them. Why? Why? Who did God have in mind when he picks Abram? Just Abram? No, it's all the children of Adam and Eve. It was Noah and his sons and their sons. It was this list. All the nations of the earth. That's what God says, okay? Let's cheat just a little bit. Jump ahead to Genesis 12. We're not there. We're going to go there in a couple weeks, but I want to look at just real briefly this morning. Genesis 12, verse 3. Just a page or two away. This is, this is the place where God makes this promise to Abram, where he chooses him, offers his blessing. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And we say, see, favoritism. No, 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 no. You got to finish it. And all the peoples on, on earth will be blessed through you. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Blessed to be a blessing. Moving from the big picture of world into the family of Abraham, right? As we're going to turn that, that's where we're headed in our study through the beginnings, through Genesis. This table of nations isn't a list of those excluded from God's plan of blessing. It's the list of all the nations who stand to benefit from God's plan to bless the seed of Abraham. In other words, God is going to pick one family and focus his attention on them, but it isn't instead of bringing blessing to all the nations of the world. It's in order to bring blessing to all the nations of the world. The the shocking twist in the storyline of the Bible is that even though it would seem God's primary focus was the children of Abraham, the nations have been on his mind the whole time. All these names, this list here in Genesis 10, the children of these people, he had a plan to bless them too. Because through Shem, down to Arphaxad, to Shelah, to Eber, Eber, by the way, the father of the Eberus, the Hebrews, Eber has a son named Peleg, and then all the way down to Abram and Isaac and Jacob and Judah until much, 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 much later. Down the line comes a boy born to a virgin, and they called him Jesus. And the first thought the people had when he shows up is, is, well, he's, he's here to save the Jews. He'll kick out the other nations. He'll restore Israel to its former glory. He's, he's here for us. Jesus had come to save his people and also to bring salvation to all the nations of the world. Right? He was condemned by his own people. He was condemned by the Jews and executed by the Gentiles. Rejected by all. But God's heart for all the world was revealed in Jesus on the cross, right? John 3, 16, we know this one. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son. And before Jesus ascends back to heaven, back to the Father, he told his disciples, go make disciples of all the nations. And the day of Pentecost arrives, and the Jews had gathered for the feast, and it says, devout people from every nation under heaven came. And the Holy Spirit comes, and everyone heard the disciples speaking in their own language, the message about Jesus. And from there, the early church was launched into the whole earth, the whole world. Jerusalem, then out to Judea, and then Samaria, and to the farthest corners of the globe. Right? From the Jewish people to the surrounding nations, the histor- even the historical enemies of the Jews, to the people out on the very edge of the world, to you and me today. It's been God's plan all along. Acts 10, Peter says this, he says, Now I truly understand, God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him, who does what is right, is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And you go to the very end of the Bible, and what's the picture of victory, of the fulfillment of God's promise and the hope of heaven, right? Revelation 7, and I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, right? Standing before the throne, before the Lamb, robed in white, palm branches in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. You say, okay, yeah, God has a heart for the world. I, 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 I believed that before, Jared, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure of it. And, and yeah, okay, what, uh, what do I do with this? Because, you know, I mean, like, you know, and maybe, maybe, I don't know how you feel about it. You could say, you know, I, I know God has a heart for all the nations of the world, uh, Maybe mine is just a size too small, <laughs> my heart, because I, I, don't, I don't know if I feel, I don't know if I feel it. I don't know if I get it. Uh, let, me, let me just speak for myself for just a minute. Um, like I said before, I was a missionary. My wife and I, up until recently, virtually our whole life, you know, married life, we, we, we spent, lived the missionary endeavor. You would think that it would make it easier for us to maintain that sort of global view but in the trenches of life, and you know how it is, in the trenches of life, it's how do I take care of me and my tribe? Right? What's going on around me? How do, how do you get that picture? How do you... There's only one thing that's ever had any effect on my heart toward the rest of the world. It's the, it's, it's the more I see what Christ was willing to do for me. You know? Common origin... Christ took on, took on humanity, put himself in your shoes, walked where you walk. You, know, you talk about common problems. He made your problems his problems. He made your pain his pain. Your guilt, your shame, your failure, he put it on himself. And common hope, he's all we've got. He's all we need. The world is full of people made in the image of God, just like you. All rebels, just like you. <laughs> With no hope apart from Jesus, just like you. You don't ever drum up compassion, a compassion like his for this world on your own. But when you know his compassion for you, it changes you. When you see his faithfulness through the whole story, his faithfulness to Israel, his faithfulness to Abraham, his faithfulness to carry out his promises to them, to the very end, right? That same faithfulness is his faithfulness towards you, to all of us. The more we see that, the more we take that in, the more it does develop in us a compassion, a heart, a view of the world, to see it the way he does. With those who are serving, prepare for communion this morning. Uh, we, call this, we call this communion. It's where we remember Jesus and his, his sacrifice for us. Um, he, told us he told us to do this together, right? To remember him together. So that as we remember him, we remember our, our common union, right? Communion. Our common union in Christ. 
that whatever nation or people or tribe you come from, we are all made one in Christ. That list of you know, 70 nations, whatever line you come from, you should know. You were born a rebel from a long line of rebels. Amen? <laughs> like everyone who came before you, all the way back to Noah, to Adam and Eve. But God in his grace worked through one family, and he came into the world so that you and I and people from every nation under heaven could have peace with him. We have an open table. Um, if you're trusting in Jesus as your Savior, then you are welcome to eat with us this morning. I'll pray, and uh, just, just please wait um, so that, yeah, we can, we can eat together afterwards. Lord, we thank you for the morning that you've given us. We thank you for life, and we do thank, for, thank you for your faithfulness. Um, Lord, we know that... Uh, we know where we come from. We don't have to know all the names in the line to know because we see it in ourselves. the same thing we've seen thus far in the story, that, that, that bent away from you, that rebellious nature, that turn towards evil. We know we have a desperate need of you and we know there is nothing we can do about it. And so we thank you for what you have done in, in coming and, and uh, taking on humanity, taking on our problems, standing in our place, bringing us forgiveness, bringing us life, and bringing us hope. And Lord, we do ask that you would build in us a compassion for those around us, that we would see this world the way you do. Again, Lord, we pray for for peace in Jerusalem. We pray that the people of Israel would be turned to you, that you, Jesus, would come and sit on your throne, that the world would come to know you for who you are. You are our only hope. And we thank you. Amen.